సో హలో గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ అండ్ గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ టు ఆల్ అవర్ స్పీకర్స్ చెహస్ అండ్ ద వండర్ఫుల్ ఆడియన్సెస్ ఇన్ డిఫరెంట్ పార్ట్స్ ఆఫ్ ద వర్ల్డ్ వెల్కమ్ బ్యాక్ టు యట్ అనదర్ ఎపిసోడ్ ఆఫ్ వెరీ ఎడ్యుకేటివ్ లెక్చర్స్ ఫర్ యూ ద స్పీకర్ ఫర్ ద ఫస్ట్ సెషన్ ఆఫ్ టుడేస్ అవర్ ఆన్ ఎట్ గెస్ట్ ఫ్రమ్ ఇటలీ ప్రొఫెసర్ మాసిమిలియానో విసోచి హీ ఇస్ అ విజిటింగ్ ప్రొఫెసర్ అట్ ద షాంగా యూనివర్సిటీ ద జార్జ్ యూనివర్సిటీ ఆఫ్ లండన్ అండ్ అట్ ద ముంబై యూనివర్సిటీ ఇండియా సిన్స్ టూ థౌజండ్ ట్వెల్వ్ హీ రీచ్ ద ఫుల్ ప్రొఫెసర్షిప్ అబ్లియేషన్ ఇన్ న్యూరో సర్జరీ సిన్స్ టూ థౌజండ్ ఎయిటీన్ హీ వాజ్ ద ప్రీవియస్ కో చైర్మన్ ఆఫ్ న్యూరో రీహాబిలిటేషన్ అండ్ రీకన్స్ట్రక్టివ్ కమిటీ ఆఫ్ ద డబ్ల్యూఎఫ్ఎన్ఎస్ సెక్రటరీ ఆఫ్ ద క్రెనివర్టిబుల్ జంక్షన్ అండ్ స్పైన్ సొసైటీ మెంబర్ ఆఫ్ ద బోర్డ్ అండ్ ఎగ్జిక్యూటివ్ బోర్డ్ ఆఫ్ వరల్డ్ న్యూరో సర్జరీ ఫెడరేషన్ ఆఫ్ క్రెనియల్ నవ్ డిసార్డర్స్ అండ్ పాస్ ప్రెసిడెంట్ ఆఫ్ ద ఇటాలియన్ సొసైటీ ఆఫ్ సెరిబ్రల్ హిమోడైనామిక్స్ ఫామ్ మెంబర్ ఆఫ్ ద బోర్డ్ ఆఫ్ ఇటాలియన్ సొసైటీ ఆఫ్ న్యూరో సర్జరీ హిస్ ఇంటర్నేషనల్ ఇన్వాల్వ్మెంట్ ఈస్ ఆల్సో డెమోన్స్ట్రేటెడ్ బై ద vast invitations that he has been as chairman or lecturer in more than 350 congresses and courses as well as by the number of international papers in which he has worked as author and co-author with international colleagues we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today he'll be talking about key ari malformations of formation what is new the speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from kazakhstan professor chingis shashkin Professor Shashkin is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Republican Research Center for Neurosurgery in Kazakhstan. He is a widely experienced neurosurgeon with more than 2,500 complex brain and spinal cord surgeries to his credit. His research interests are focused upon epilepsy surgery, DBS, surgery for spasticity and complex operations on brain and spinal cord tumors. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and he will be talking about percutaneous cordotomy, indication techniques and complication. The chair for the session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Belgium, Professor Christian Raftopoulos. Professor Raftopoulos is a professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery at St. Luke University Hospitals, Brazil, Belgium. Professor Raftopoulos' scientific contributions include the development of new classification of ICP waves and development of modified surgical techniques for Chiari malformations, meningocils and cranial aneurysms. Currently, he is involved in epilepsy surgery and new minimally invasive spinal techniques. His considerable work is reflected in more than hundreds of articles in which he has authored and co-authored he was a past general secretary and the president of the french language neurosurgery society also known as the society de neurochirurgie de langue francaise we are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of professor massimiliano visochi on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president professor yoko kato i would like to welcome both the speakers and chair to this online platform of acns webinars a very warm welcome to our colleagues in china and we are extremely grateful to professor shubin for broadcasting this on the wechat channel dr lubun singh from malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction i would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair professor christian rafter paulus it's always a pleasure to participate to your acns meeting because i know even if even as a chair i know that i will all the time learn something new and to see my colleagues from around the world is also a great pleasure i think that the lecture that our colleague professor visochi will give us today is particularly interesting because we know that carry malformation is a rather common problem Uh, the incidence is more or less 2% uh, in the general population so it's a common problem and there are a lot of controversial uh, points regarding the physiopathology the the treatment uh, the notion of an occult tetracord syndrome which could be the cause of a carry malformation so uh, uh, i'm very eager to to listen our colleague professor visochi and i am happy to give him to give him now the floor thank you thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and for this uh, introduction i i go ahead this is a very challenging topic as far as uh, you know because it's a deep ocean so far there are many interpretation of this uh, challenging uh, quite uh, mysterious um uh, clinical pattern as demonstrated by many webinars all over the world under the patronage of world federation uh, on uh, uh, the craniovertebral junction and spine society uh, neuro rehabilitation reconstructive committee of the world federation many other uh, um, society or association uh, included consensus conference which uh, are blooming up all over the world 
uh, every every uh, years in order to better clarify strategies, diagnostics, and also uh, surgical uh, therapy. The last consensus conference was held in Brazil one month ago about uh, um, close uh, during uh, the uh, Brazilian Spine uh, Society and uh, uh, it was divided many topics. Uh, each one of those were assigned to uh, speakers, um, expert of uh, a special issue concerning uh, Chiari malformation. I was in charge to speak about criteria for surgical treatment and uh, uh, these were uh, the main uh, questions to be proposed and uh, try to, uh, to, to um, satisfy and answer. And uh, many papers are uh, available over the world dealing with classification. Classification is still a challenge. Uh, we have at least uh, four types of uh, Chiari syndromes. Type one is uh, a encroachment of a posterior cranial fossa without tonsillar ectopia and without syringomyelia. Type 0 0.5 is just syringomyelia without uh, um, tonsillar herniation. Type one is tonsillar herniation more than five millimeters uh, below the foramen manum, not always associated with the syringomyelia. Type 1.5 is uh, uh, the um, tonsillar herniation associated with uh, disembryogenetic uh, uh, pathologies like uh, keeper file, uh, uh, like odontoid retroversion or basal invagination, like many other cervical dystrophies. Type two is a herniation of <coughs> the tonsil along with the vermis and the pons down to the uh, occipital uh, foramen associated almost 100% uh, of the cases with the spinal dystrophism and the hydrocephalus. Type three is a occipital hernia containing cerebellar tissue. Type four is aplasia or hypoplasia of a cerebellum. Quite difficult to remember, always updated during the year. So we have many opportunity to call the same uh, uh, topic. And as in the American slang, many ways to skin a cat. And so here in these slides, you can see normal cerebral tonsils um, terbellar tonsil herniation of 3.5 uh, 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 um, millimeters and uh, tonsil herniation, the true Chiari malformation below uh, the foramen manual of more of five millimeters. Again, when we speak about Chiari 2, we speak about pediatric disease with the massive uh, herniation of uh, the brainstem and the uh, uh, cerebellum with uh, almost 100% spina bifida and hydrocephalus. And uh, also with uh, progressive hydrocephalus and respiratory distress. This is an emergency. On the other hand, Chiari 1, especially involving uh, adult people with uh, the simple uh, tonsil herniation without brainstem and cerebellum, hydrocephalus and spina bifida can be present, but it is not the rule. And uh, the presentation is uh, for cervical pain and not respiratory distress, not intracranial hypertension. This is uh, an awful example of uh, Chiari 3 malformation with uh, occipital brain herniation on the neck. 
of, of for sure this is not uh, suitable and compatible with life. About the theology, we have two main uh, uh, railways uh, going towards the identification of the etiology. Number one is compression, number two is uh, traction. When we speak about number one compression, we speak about mole posterior fossa, and this is the key, and uh, encroachment and crowding uh, posterior cranial fossa generally can be associated with the hydrocephalus or a craniosynostosis producing a, a craniocaudal pressure cone or other abnormality of the upper cervical spine like hyperfile, occipitalization of the upper fusion, the defect of a segmentation, basia invalidination, craniovertebral junction instability. Finally, we can consider also arachnoid fibrosis around the, the tonsil. When we speak about uh, attraction mechanism, we have only two subjects to speak about. Number one is tether cord or so-called tether cord. Number two is idiopathic intracranial eye potential. We will speak about it. The rule of a posterior cranial fossa is uh, crucial. As you can see, the normal uh, shape on the left panel is uh, a rhomboid. Otherwise, when you have a different shape uh, on the posterior cranial fossa, you can have uh, a tonsillar herniation associated with uh, a modification of CSF flow trends, like uh, uh, well explained in this uh, slide with the uh, turbulence of uh, uh, CSF flow in the left panel. Turbulence is due to increasing pressure gradients. You can also show the problem with the uh, uh, other um, uh, way to detect as uh, echography, as uh, scintigraphy, but the turbulence uh, and the irregular CSF flow trend is an uh, important uh, key point in uh, Chiari identification. How to operate this uh, challenging disease? Number one, first of all, who operate? The one harboring clinical symptoms. This is the main concept to be stressed. And uh, uh, the one harboring uh, contemporary Chiari malformation settings are suitable for the compressive surgery. And in neonates, Chiari 2 is a surgical emergency. When? As soon as possible in Chiari 2, in neonates, as soon as possible, is a true emergency. Otherwise, as soon as uh, the symptoms rise up and according to the gravity of the symptoms, we proceed to surgery. But no literature data are available in order to better classify the timing. How to operate this patient? In a different way, the simplest is uh, just a suboccipital craniectomy, and it's enough. Otherwise, uh, suboccipital craniectomy and duroplasty when uh, dealing with uh, syrinx, and uh, also when dealing with the uh, grade two Chiari malformation. We have to keep in mind that uh, Chiari one malformation can be associated also with uh, neuropsychological function change. Uh, according to the Diaschisi mechanism uh, claimed for uh, postoperative uh, uh, cerebellar surgery uh, mutism, Acinetic mutism and many other uh, um, dysfunction of uh, um, phasic uh, uh, capability. In this slide, we have a summary of all the surgical uh, options, and we will uh, uh, investigate all of them and try to understand the most suitable of those, according also to the 
guidelines uh, available in the literature. Suboccipital craniectomy is the most simple approach. Generally, is uh, by um, it's alone, but someone had also dural delamination as uh, demonstrated in this uh, paper. There is not statistical difference in uh, post-op uh, um, clinical status of patient. Uh, by uh, performing a simple bone decompression and uh, dural delamination. No difference, no difference uh, in, uh, in a follow up. The most important concept is that uh, the craniectomy needs to be, to be not so large, uh, rounding uh, from uh, two centimeter to 2.5 centimeter wide. On the other hand, we have other uh, papers, uh, a different concept, transverse micro incision of the outer layer of dura mother is mandatory in order to ensure a good uh, uh, post-op uh, uh, follow-up. Then we have also uh, other surgical strategies like craniectomy and durotomy with the arachnoid preservation. Craniectomy and durotomy, who do, does it? In this paper published in um, my book, uh, edited by Acta Neurochirurgica in, in 2018, in uh, which I tried to collect all of the most uh, updated craniovertebral junction papers available in the la literature, uh, durotomy uh, with uh, arachnoid preservation is uh, a opportunity. In fact, according to Spallone, the author of this pa paper, you can leave the patient with the dural open without injuring the arachnoid and generally uh, CSF leakage when present can solve spontaneously with uh, a significant success from a clinical point of view. Then we have also craniectomy and dural patch. Craniectomy and dural patch is very simple, very frequent and popular a surgical maneuver for all posterior craniofossal fossa surgery. And all of us uh, are uh, confident with uh, autologous uh, uh, flap, like peripranium fascialata or heterologous cadaveric dura or bovine pericardium, for instance, or a synthetic gorotex is uh, an example, synthetic ma ma material. And the uh, follow-up is uh, satisfying. Again, we have uh, another uh, four option, craniectomy, tonsil coagulation, aracoid brightening, obex opening, and dural patch. And in this paper, again, of Italian school, I'm a co-author of this paper, intradural membranes, veils, and pooch removal is claimed in order to be sure about long-standing uh, clinical and neuroradiological results in this patient. Someone also add to this uh, extensive approach bipolar coagulation and subsequent shrinkage of uh, both tonsilla. And uh, um, generally more than 50% improve uh, and in more than 50% shrinks disappear. So this is one of the most uh, promising and the most uh, um, effective uh, uh, surgical strategies when dealing with uh, Chiari malformation and syrinx. Uh, you know, fistula is the drawbacks, the, the, the possible complication of this extensive approach. And fistula occurs in uh, around five, six percent of the cases undergoing to uh, dura opening uh, and a shrinkage of a tonsillar, both tonsillar and uh, uh, arachnoid debridements uh, and uh, so on. 
uh, the lower recurrence rate is associated with the higher CSF distal. Then we have also the anterior decompression of uh, Chiari 1.5 type. As you remember, Chiari 1.5 type is the one associated with the basilar invagination or clipper file, sometimes also cranioretable junction instability. And in this uh, condition, it can uh, be indicated decompression by arterial approach and subsequent instrumentation infusion. And uh, this is another paper where the author, a Chinese guy, uh, claims that uh, basilar invagination and Chiari 1 are the most common association in adult cranial vertebral junction malformation. This is my personal experience with uh, uh, basilar invagination uh, type uh, um, uh, A, according to the very first adult goal classification associated with platybasia, associated with, uh, you see here, a Chiari malformation type one. Soon after anterior decompression, there is a disappearance of a Chiari herniation. Please look at how huge is this anterior decompression from the body of C2 up to the end of the superior third of the clivus, close to the uh, synchondrosis between the sphenoid bone and the clivus bone. Look at that this time. Very impressive decompression, very impressive surgical postoperative control, but look at that. What happened six, eight months later on? The odontoid regrow up and the ter superior third of the clivus also try to regrow down. As soon as uh, they impinge the posterior fossa and the posterior fossa become crowded. Look at that. The odonto, the mm, tonsilla try to herniate again up to one year later on surgery when the clivus is quite completely regrowed and also the odontoid is quite pretty completely regrowed and also the Chiari malformation pop up back again for the same time, for the second time. And this is the practical, quite experimental demonstration that uh, and basilar invagination is uh, the cause of uh, uh, a, a tonsillary herniation. And uh, we had to re-explore the patient to further decompress the patient. So in 1.5 Chiari malformation, basal invagination and anterior compression of the posterior fossa is the interpretative key, key for uh, planning surgery in these cases. Anterior decompression is a novel and promising approach in uh, 1.5 Chiari malformation, the one associated with the basal invagination. Then we have the very, my good friend, uh, Atul Goel, my brother friend, Atul Goel, who is claiming from uh, since many years, the need of C1, C2 instrumentation infusion in order to treat and successfully operate 100%, 100%, I underline 100% of Chiari 1, patient according to his theories. Look at that. On the left, we have uh, Chiari. On the right, after uh, C1, C2 instrumentation, the so-called Goel instrumentation infusion, completely disappeared. 
and uh, so according to uh, with the some author the distraction of the dance by putting uh, the graft in c1 c2 articulation is enough to decompress functionally the patient uh, harboring chiari one malformation but caution is suggested when uh, indicated when indicating in 100% of carry one patient C1, C2 fusion as the etiological treatment. Indirect decompression is the key, but we also know that uh, we have uh, to select as much as possible this treatment to the one who deserve it. Then we have uh, the big important chapter of uh, syrinx and uh, its treatment, syringostomy and syrinx shunting. First of all, we have to remember the syrinx classification of uh, the uh, current literature. Type one syrinx is the one associated to Chiari malformation. Type two syrinx is uh, the one who is uh, idiopathic. Type 3 syrinx is uh, the one associated with the spinal cord tumor, traumatic myelopathy, arachnoiditis, myelomalacia. <coughs> Type 4 is a pure hydromyelia, which is a, a development widening of a central canal. What to do with the uh, uh, syrinx? When we deal with the uh, syrinx associated or not with Chiari malformation, we have uh, to look for a symptomatology. If symptomatology is uh, consistent, for instance, disos suspended, dissociated, hypoesthesia or anesthesia, for sure, the treatment is the one that we all know so well in our day life clinical and surgical practice to uh, open the settings in the more uh, slim posterior surface to put inside a drainage communicating with the center of the sinks or the uh, subarachnoid space or the peritoneum or the pleura or the posterior cranial fossa. And uh, you know, there are uh, <coughs> many variants about uh, this way to deal with the uh, syrinx. But uh, come back to hydrocephalus and uh, other uh, hypertensive uh, uh, condition uh, producing a cranial caudal uh, cone pressure. Hydrocephalus, this is the clinical practice demonstration of how hydrocephalus is involved in the etiology of Chiari 1. This is a patient, a pediatric patient with the drained uh, hydrocephalus uh, as soon as uh, the uh, uh, CSF drain uh, system uh, uh, malfunction occur you see here the red uh, arrow, the syrinx uh, pop up again. And as far as you correct the shunt malfunction, the syrinx disappear. So this is the practical demonstration that uh, hydrocephalus is involved in the um, Chiari formation, Chiari formation in some times when it is present and in those occasions shunting procedures are indicated as craniosynostosis is uh, one of the possible etiological factors of uh, Chiari uh, one malformation when you detect the association of uh, craniosynostosis Chiari one malformation please open the vault and operate the uh, malformation then we move to tether cord syndrome, very discussed uh, condition. 
you know that the school of Milorat and the Bolognese, Paolo Bo and Alessandro Bo Paolo Bolognese, is uh, uh, specially uh, devoted to the concept that uh, attraction from below on uh, the spinal cord uh, by means of uh, the tethering of uh, uh, filum terminalis can be involved in the genesis of uh, uh, carry one malformation in a normal size posterior carrier fossa. And uh, uh, also, without any neuroradiological demonstration of a tether cord, there is a, a group in Spain, in Europe, who's uh, strongly pushing for uh, promoting the tethering of uh, the uh, spinal cord by cutting the uh, filum terminalis with uh, both extradural and uh, intradural uh, surgical approach, even in uh, those cases not clearly associated with the tether cord syndrome. And this is the uh, explanation of why the Italian Society of Neurosurgery wrote an official paper against this procedure as 100% considered uh, uh, valid uh, procedures for carry one malformation. It can be indicated according to Millerat with uh, moderate degrees of proxilar ectopia, but it is not a standardized gold standard uh, surgical procedure since there is no scientific support. And then we conclude with the uh, intracranial hypotension, which is uh, a strange condition, which uh, was a uh, highlight uh, in the last uh, couple of decades. And um, uh, it's a, a special condition where we have uh, a CS, spontaneous CFX, CSF uh, leakage, spontaneous CSF leakage with the intracranial hypotension and uh, fraction of meninges and enlargement of dural arteries, cortical medullary veins, and dural sinuses, according to the Morro Kelly doctor. When you reduce the volume of CSF, you increase the volume of cerebral blood flow, both venous and arterial one. And so this is the neuroradiological uh, uh, clinical uh, pattern at uh, the spinal cord, epidural CSF collection due to spontaneous condition or um, unknown uh, spine trauma in the past or a surgery in uh, disc surgery, and uh, you have a pedural CSF collection also along the nerve roots, and uh, you can have uh, multiple sites, and the therapy is uh, conservative, bed rest or caffeine, or epidural blood patch, or fibrin glue epidural blood patch, or surgical uh, repair in uh, uh, micro uh, surgical technique. Brain imaging, again, subdural collection, hygromas due to intracranial hypotension, again, enhancement of meninges, again, engorgement of venous structures, again, pituitary hyperemia, and finally, what interests us, sagging of the brain, in other words, Chiari 1, conciliary herniation, associated with the CSF hypotension, in other words, associated with the, a traction mechanism. In conclusion, when we deal with Chiari 1 without symptoms, no surgery. When we deal with Chiari 2, surgical strategy, because Chiari 2 can be an emergency in the neonates. What about uh, uh, recurrence? Uh, recurrence is uh, when uh, you, uh, is a, a consequence of a partial treatment, a not effective, partial, conservative, treatment, like simple 
occipital, occipital craniectomy. Otherwise, when you perform a wide suboccipital craniectomy, a wide uh, durotomy, duroplasty, with uh, arachnoid membranes, uh, uh, debridements, or shrinkage uh, by coagulation of the tonsilla, you have the highest rate of success, but you have also 6% rates of a CSF fistula. But I like to conclude uh, with uh, these uh, few slides uh, uh, related with uh, the last consensus conference uh, in uh, Italy with the Delphi trials uh, uh, mode with uh, three Delphi trials rounds, which drove our group to publish the final documents in 2019 and 100% uh, of agreement uh, around 100% of agreement is that uh, in uh, symptomatic diary uh, malformation without surgery surgery is without uh, syringoma area surgery is indicated in adults with the uh, age and uh, auditory cerebral bulbar spinal sign that's important. Symptomatology is the driving force of surgery. Uh, otherwise, Chiari uh, malformation type 1 without uh, syringoma area and without symptoms is not uh, devoted to surgery, just to observe. When you deal with the Chiari malformation type 1 with the syringomelia, surgery is indicated when you deal with the holocord syringomelia associated with the clinical and neuroradiological worsening. That's important. And finally, Chiari 1 malformation with the syringomelia is a matter to be further investigated with the polysonography uh, when suspected, suspecting that the patient harbor sleep apnea. Again, type 1.5 Chiari malformation, the one associated with the basal invagination, please decompress from anterior and then stabilize. Then, state, statement number six, cranioretical junction fixation is indicated only when a, a neuroradiological instability is documented. And finally, statement number 10, fixation can be C1, C2, according to Goal philosophy, or C3, C, C, C0, C3, according to the local spatial anatomy of the patient. Again, Chiari with the syringomelia, bony decompression and duroplasty. Watertight suture is mandatory when performing duroplasty. Finally, and we conclude, I'm a, in, in papers, scientific papers reviewer as you are to review a Chiari malformation papers can be a real challenge. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you for that very interesting lecture, very extensive report of the uh, state of the art regarding the management of Chiari 1 malformation. Uh, I would like to stress a point you have reported a mortality of 2% when dealing with uh, the carry one malformation. And uh, even if the mortality 0, 0.0 something, I think we have all surgeons has to fight to reduce the mortality rate to as low as possible. So that in my department, uh, we decided many years ago to propose as a first stage treatment for symptomatic carry one malformation, an outer layer dura resection. 
and uh, it works in 75% of the patient. That means only 25% of the patient uh, who do not respond to, to an outer layered URA resection will go for a open URA surgery with eventually tonsil resection. And so with a much lower risk of CSF leak and of course meningitis, what is very, very, uh, uh, very sad for the patient and the family. Uh, it's my first point. My second point is to hear if you, if you know, if you, uh, my colleague Visocci, you, you know what is your experience regarding the C1, C2 fusion and if someone in the audience has any positive uh, experience regarding the C1, C2 fusion as a treatment of uh, the carry one malformation. And my last comment will be, uh, what is you, your position regarding the section of the film terminale in, in a case of of uh, occult tethered cord syndrome for treatment of um, carry malformation type one. Thank you so much for your three very interesting questions. Very, very challenging, interesting. I think that you focalized the three key points of my presentation. And, uh, you know, I'm a, a quite old neurosurgeon. And so I, um, since I'm old, uh, I like to prove, I like to check, I, like to, I love to have confirmation of uh, theories and ideas and etiological interpretation. And in order to do something, I want to touch and to confirm. And so I try to answer to your three interesting questions. Number one, uh, the difference between open and closed uh, uh, surgical uh, strategy. Uh, I think that uh, in this case, I'm very confident that uh, the final uh, uh, um, guidelines uh, of uh, both consensus conference, uh, the Euro Italian and Brazilian one, are uh, reliable. And uh, that uh, means that uh, when you deal with the simple Chiari one without syringomyelia, and um, with uh, headache and soft uh, uh, disturbances, um, suboccipital craniectomy can be enough. And you know, when you, uh, the, 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 you produce a lamination with the dura in, uh, in, in a way or in, in the other, uh, I'm sure that you produce also a CSF leak. And uh, when you produce a CFX leak, because you are not, you, you cannot be confident to remain within one layer of the double layer system of the dura. And when you open the dura in posterior carina fossa, generally you have to pay the fee for that. And you have to withdraw with the syrinx um, to perform a compressive craniectomy. Sometime you have to put uh, the lumbar drainage and to help the wound to heal. And so my answer is that uh, in uh, uh, benign Chiari 1 uh, symptomatology without the syrinx, posterior carnal fossa decompression without the opening of the dura, at least sometime uh, uh, um, opening the layers could be the solution. Otherwise, when you deal with a complicated Chiari 1 uh, um, disease uh, like the one associated with dysphagia, with uh, um, the, the, you know uh, uh, dysfunction of uh, the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh, uh, the hypoglossus. When you have a stridor of the voice of the patient, you need to perform uh, uh, plastic plastic and you have to open the dura and offer space. And uh, if uh, you see that there are some arachnoiditis uh, uh, brights, you have to debride them and to open uh, the um, calamus scriptorius. For sure, 
when you have sittings, you have to open sittings, in my personal opinion, even though many colleagues say, no, not necessary, just to the compressed sittings disappear. But in my personal experience, I don't know why, but uh, I have uh, a quite interesting uh, percentage of unsuccess in uh, sittings disappearance after a simple posterior craniectomy. Second question, you ask about C1, C2. C1, C2 instrumentation infusion. Although I am very friend of Abu Goel and he knows that it is true, I do not perform C1, C2 instrumentation infusion unless I have the proof that C1, C2 complex is unstable with dynamic X-rays examination. Otherwise, I can tolerate uh, C1, C2 distraction along with, uh, or, uh, or along with, it is mandatory, C1, C2 distraction of uh, the um, articular facet, because this is the maneuver that produce a functional decompression of a cranial vertebral junction malformation associated with carry one as a basilar invagination, for instance. In that case, I can um, suggest C1, C2 instrumentation infusion with distraction, with the graft, with the, the uh, bone graft uh, uh, in uh, between both C1, C2 articulation. Third question, the tethering uh, spinal cord. I detect a spinal cord only when I have the proof that there is a, a cord tethering. When uh, the conus is below L1, L2 uh, metameric level. And in this case, if I have a true uh, Chiari 1 malformation along with the conus middolaris below L2, I can look at uh, the tethering the spinal cord by sectioning film, middle, uh, film terminalis with uh, the help of uh, neuromonitoring with the intradural approach, with the intradural approach by identifying both visually or neurophysiologically the film terminalis. I hope to have answered uh, properly to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. have a question in the chat. Do you find a fibrous band around the foramen magnus over dura after bony decompression? Uh, yes, you know, it is uh, not the rule, but you can find it and uh, it can rise up uh, a couple of questions when you find a band. First question is uh, how to manage it for sure to open it, to remove, to section. Not to remove it uh, totally, but just to cut vertically and with the uh, carison romber uh, make uh, mm, uh, uh, that uh, the ligament could not repair with time. So uh, just remove uh, one central third of this uh, band, fibrous band. Second question is why the Sec the, the, the fibrous band rise up in this uh, complex cranial junction malformation. Probably the answer could be because of, because of instability, because of uh, uh, an apparent C1, C2 instability, and how to focalize C1, C2 instability in only one way with dynamic six rays. If the dynamics is raised, both uh, coronal plate, plane, both the sagittal plate, both the lateral bending plate, both rotatory uh, motion planes, uh, if you prove C1, C2 instability, please uh, uh, instruments and fuse them. Otherwise, do not do. Thank you, thank I you very much. Yes, I have still a question, very short, very short. 
uh, my question is, in your personal experience, in which percentage of carry malformation type one did you identify, did you demonstrate clearly a craniocervical instability? Hmm, very low, very low. No an, more an than five, ten percent. No more. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. If I may ask one question uh, to Professor Visochi is like in patients with Chiari one and scoliosis. Okay. What is the preferred uh, mode of surgical treatment? Whether you need to address the scoliosis or the malformations first? Uh, I have some difficulty to hear because the the the, the volume of my um, uh, mobile uh, uh, laptop. Uh, you you, you I'm, are I'm asking, asking about scoliosis and KRE one malformations. Which do you address first? The scoliosis part or the KRE? Ah, scoliosis, scoliosis. Yes. Okay, scoliosis. Good question. It's a mystery. Uh, who was born before the egg of the chicken? You know that uh, in the popular um, joke, the main uh, question is uh, who was born first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, who was born first, Chiari malformation or a scoliosis? Because according to some uh, researcher, Chiari can produce when a very, very aggressive form, for, can produce a weakness of a paraspinal um, muscle in the very uh, uh, newborn age, in an early stage of life. And this could uh, produce a, a progressive scoliosis. Otherwise, someone uh, can say that scoliosis is, uh, was born first and uh, scoliosis can produce a, a tethering of uh, the cord and a traction from below of uh, uh, the brainstem and of uh, uh, the uh, posterior cranial fossa in a very early uh, age stage. And so someone says that uh, Chiari is the consequence. Generally, uh, in this second situation, Chiari is associated with the syringomyelia, for sure, because we know that syringomyelia is frequently associated with, uh, with Chiari. What to do and how to behave? Uh, this is the real question. I think that uh, we cannot change mother nature willing we just to have we have to fire against the most aggressive and dangerous enemy and we have to evaluate among chiari and scoliosis which is the most eloquent enemy to fire against and in case the Chiari symptoms are particularly evident, Chiari must be operated first. Otherwise, in case scoliosis symptoms are predominant, let's go to a deformity expert neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon and operate scoliosis. And soon after these two steps, you just follow up the patient and look at the possible improvement of the not operated disease associated to the one which was operated and decide with time after two, three, four, five years if it is necessary to operate also the other disease uh, that uh, you spared at uh, the first surgical step. I don't know if, uh, if I'm a clear, so enough clear in my explanation, but uh, the concept is uh, 
first shot against the most eloquent enemy, chiari or uh, scoliosis. Wait and see, and then decide to shot against also the other pathology you have not uh, operated at the first step. Great, thank you very much. We have Professor K.K. Turel joining us. Professor Turel, any comments from you? Please unmute your mic, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. That was very nice, Dr. Visochi. Uh, two small points. One is C1, C2 uh, instability may not be visible purely on x-rays, just by extension flexion. I think you should see the CD scan more accurately, and you may find a, the joint displacement. Right? Can you see over here that this uh, C1, C2 joint may go a little forward, and you may not see that uh, this uh, dislocation on the extension flexion pictures. But I'm not saying that uh, it doesn't take away anything from your idea of doing the decompression, craniectomy, and neurotomy and neuroplasty. I think the CSF leak issue uh, is the thing which is causing concern in those people who are uh, uh, talking about posterior fossa decompression. And that is because probably I have, you see, we have heard two types of theories. One theory that says there is increased pressure in the posterior fossa. And there's another theory which says it's a low pressure syndrome, which is why the tonsils are herniating. So we have two contradictory theories. So we have to be sure that there is no, that we have ruled out any area of CSF leak from the dura before you, uh, from in the spinal dura, before you consider doing a posterior fossa decompression. Uh, that may be one point. And, and a, a, a guarantee against CSF leak would be an excellent, of course, duraplasty, but provided your decompression also is adequate. If your decompression is insufficient, I know some people are doing endoscopic decompression. Um, and I've heard that for the first time from uh, Professor Joe. Um, I don't know his results, but the uh, decompression, if it is not adequate, then the pressure in the posterior fossa remains high. And that may probably aggravate uh, the incidence of CSF leak. But the good duraplasty and a good dural decompression would ensure against CSF leak. And of course, followed by a good muscle closure. Very often we tend to leave this part of the operation to some of our associates, junior associates, and must ensure it's not only the dura closure that matters, but also very good muscle closure that uh, provides that uh, prevents a CSF leakage. Um, I think uh, that's about all that I have to comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Keiki Turel. We'll take the final question from my co-host Lubun Singh before we turn on to Professor Christian Dr. Paulus. Thank, you. Thanks, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, my question, Professor, uh, what is your opinion regarding uh, posterior fossa uh, reconstruction uh, with the uh, displacement of the sub-hospital bone uh, posteriorly uh, and fixed with uh, a mesh uh, that we allow a larger uh, sub-hospital craniotomy, reduce the cerebellar sagging, and also reduce the risk of CSF leakage. Uh, my second question, uh, Professor, uh, regarding uh, lateral displacement of the tonsil by suturing the PR method, would that help uh, in, in reducing the string? Thank you, Professor. A very, very good observation. Uh, personally, I am um, not experienced about uh, uh, reconstruction of posterior carina fossa in uh, um, Chiari malformation surgery. But I think that is a very clever, brilliant idea to investigate about. Uh, since, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, aim of uh, surgery uh, of uh, uh, cerebellar tumor is just to open posterior carina fossa, to open the window, remove the tumor, and you can close the window since uh, the um, progressive disease was completely removed. In uh, Chiari one malformation, the concept is uh, to open the windows and leave it open since uh, 
uh, to open a window means uh, to enlarge the global volume of fossil ukraine fossa so when you put the mesh uh, for sure you don't uh, uh, encroach the fossil ukraine fossa since the mesh or, uh, is lying in the uh, external part of uh, the bone so um, you don't compromise uh, the enlargement of posterior carnal fossa. And I do not consider uh, the mesh like uh, a complication for uh, uh, Chiari one malformation. I simply consider, consider it a not uh, mandatory option in uh, the concept of Chiari surgery since you know that uh, there is not any uh, risk or any uh, contraindication in leaving open the posterior cranial bone as uh, for many years and up to now we are used to do, to do because we have uh, uh, eight centimeter of uh, organic layers made of uh, fascia muscles, um, again, fascia, subcutaneous tissue, fat, uh, and uh, uh, skin, uh, protecting the posterior cranial fossa and the cerebellum from uh, the, um, the, 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 the risk of uh, injury uh, without uh, the mesh. But I recognize that the idea to put the mesh could be a good idea. I will try next time. Thank you for your observation. Very well. Thank you very much, Liu, for that. I would like to go back to Professor Christian Rafta Paulus to hear his concluding remarks. Uh, I would like to conclude in two parts. I think if I, I am confronted with a patient, a young patient with Chiari syringo scoliosis, I will always go first for the Chiari, second for the syringo, and third for the scoliosis. I do not any cases of scoliosis, treated scoliosis with, uh, with disappearance of a syringo of a, of a Chiari. So I would go first for Chiari and secondly for uh, syringo. And now I would like to thank uh, Professor Visocci for that presentation, very extensive presentation, and also all the participants and uh, particularly uh, you, Raja, for the organization, perfect organization as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Christian Raftopoulos, for these very kind words. And extremely grateful to Professor Visochi for these beautiful lectures. And a special thanks to all the distinguished dignitaries who joined. I would like to mention that this webinar is being broadcasted on WeChat, YouTube, and Zoom. And as of now, we have around 525 people live who have joined us to watch this webinar. Thank you very much. Yes, Before, uh, giving uh, my thanks to you in this uh, uh, wonderful organization, I, I wish to remember that uh, uh, I'm uh, holding a, a European master course in cardiovascular junction disease each year. And if you are interested, please uh, uh, contact me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. It's extremely great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, Professor of Christian Dr. Paulos is here. We will hand this over to him, Professor, for the second lecture, which is about scodotomy. Uh, I must say that uh, if, I, if I stay for that presentation, it's only because of the lecturer, but, but also for the topic, because scodotomy is probably a procedure that we do not use enough. And... Uh, and I have seen and I have heard the experience of some of us using that technique with wonderful, very impressive results regarding the quality of life of uh, very painful patients. And uh, I'm very interesting to, and I would recommend a, a lot of people to listen to that presentation because not only it's not well, uh, known by a lot of us, but not, not, we are not speaking enough ab about that procedure, which can be a very, very, very efficient for the patient.
So I'm eager to, to, to listen to my colleague, Shashkin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to organizers, Nadja and uh, other uh, colleagues for inviting, uh, for inviting me for this uh, session. Uh, let me uh, start my presentation. Actually, I want to say that, uh, Raja, I moved from uh, Respub Republican Center for Neurosurgery to another city. Now I'm working uh, in Almaty City in Kazakhstan, and I'm head of Neurosurgery in the Department. Uh, uh, today, I want to uh, talk about uh, chordotomy. It's uh, 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 minimal invasion uh, surgery for pain. Uh, about 10% of oncological patients suffer from intractable pain. Uh, we have a lot of oncological patients uh, and the majority of them uh, suffer from pain. And 50% uh, uh, are untreated, undertreated and uh, uh, about 10% suffer from intractable pain. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, these 10% of patients uh, cannot, ach cannot achieve uh, um, uh, treatment from the uh, conservative uh, drugs and uh, they suffer every day from uh, tractable pain. Uh, and uh, uh, usually these patients, uh, especially when they are in terminal stage of their illness, the, the patients are severe and uh, the procedures uh, which uh, we are going to uh, do them should be quick, minimally invasive, uh, preferably without general anesthesia, uh, especially uh, patients with a severe oncological uh, uh, disease from lungs and uh, other uh, internal uh, organs. And the uh, uh, intermediate pain reduction should be uh, our uh, target. Uh, and uh, the patient does not interfere with the patient oncology and treatment, and uh, uh, we should support the patient's good of care. Uh, we have the uh, two uh, big groups of neurosurgical intervention, interventions for pain. Uh, this is a narrow, uh, these are narrow ablation and the narrow modulation. And of course, for uh, oncological patients, uh, we could uh, successfully use narrow ablation techniques uh, versus narrow modulation. Narrow modulation is, uh, narrow modulation, uh, is very, uh, you know, um, uh, expensive and uh, uh, according to uh, the uh, life expectancy uh, to be uh, not too um, practical. Uh, we have uh, several approaches to, to neurosurgical related procedures for intractable pain in cancer patients. Uh, when we have um, diffuse pain, we can uh, use the brain uh, surgery for the brain, uh, especially singulotomy. And we have, uh, if the patient has the total uh, original pain, we uh, can disconnect the subspinal thalamic tract uh, doing the uh, nucleotomy, tractotomy, cordotomy, or myelotomy. Cordotomy is a destruction of the pain uh, pathways of the spinal cord uh, through the spinal thalamic tract located in the anterolateral quadrant of the spinal cord to relieve the patient's pain. Uh, the first, uh, this uh, technique was uh, conducted in uh, 1912 by neurosurgeons William Spiller and uh, Edward Martin. Uh, but they uh, started with open surgery, uh, doing the very huge procedure uh, to uh, approach to the anterior spinal cord in the cervical spine uh, due to one in uh, Now we have uh, a future uh, interest uh, uh, for cordotomy, and um, PubMed we found uh, more than 200 papers about this procedure. And uh, uh, <coughs> uh, in 1963, uh, uh, the 
the resurgence started to be minimally invasive uh, with the continuous uh, technique. So the goal of cordotomy is ablation of spinal thalamic tract, uh, uh, which uh, combine pain and temperature fibers in the anterolateral quadrant of spinal cord. The more uh, best indication is patient with unilateral localized pain uh, due to malignancy and uh, with a not septic pain. Uh, it's very important to know that uh, we could, uh, with the cordotomy, we could uh, help the patients who have as only a unilateral localized pain. Uh, the technique is uh, pure minimal invasive, percutaneous, uh, and uh, mm, we can uh, ablate, uh, ablate uh, two, three levels uh, of pain. The indications for cordotomy is malignant and benign formations involving nervous structure or without it as a result of uh, acute pain in the body and limbs. Uh, uh, in this uh, in the technique we usually uh, use for patients with limited life expectancy and suffering from opioid resistance cancer pain. And, uh, uh, if we're uh, is, uh, is about four points, and uh, uh, on the ground taking a, a lot of energetics uh, without uh, success. Patients, uh, uh, as a uh, usual procedure, we have a contraindication and complication. Uh, is contraindicated uh, in patients with coagulation disorder, severe re reduced ventilation functions, and uh, uh, if the patient is unable to cooperate. Uh, uh, complications include disease, retention, ataxia, paresis, symptomatic dysfunctions. Uh, sexually sensitivity in or loss, and the uh, form of sleep apnea. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the risk of severe complication uh, is very low. Uh, procedure related mortality is reported in range of one to six percent, uh, but it's mainly due to respiratory dysfunction. If we do it uh, more accurate, we can uh, achieve a uh, uh, very rare complication rate. There's a poor to me. stands alone uh, as a neurosurgical ablative technique with the most experience. Uh, you can see that uh, 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 from the uh, all kind of procedures, more patients will uh, uh, done uh, with uh, cordotomy. Mm. You see the uh, main uh, papers uh, uh, which were conducted to cordotomy. Uh, we uh, uh, Based on the Campola uh, paper and the uh, Strauss from Israel. So it was the uh, most uh, uh, interested. And uh, now we use the TT guided uh, uh, percutaneous uh, cordotomy, which should uh, 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 in uh, Strauss uh, paper. Uh, for example, his uh, uh, experience was more than 50, uh, 60 per, 50 percent uh, patients, and uh, most of them uh, were uh, very uh, with good uh, improvement. Uh, 80, uh, 86 uh, percent uh, improved, and uh, uh, we see that uh, 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 survival and uh, pain recurrence um, was uh, several months. As I told, it, uh, it was a uh, kind of open surgery, uh, uh, open cordotomy, but now uh, 
I, I want to uh, explain the, how we do the city guided prototypes for uh in our uh, uh, hospital. Uh, we don't have uh, 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 the hugest uh, experience in this, uh, but anyway, we do it. Uh, we done uh, more now more than fifteen patients, and uh, uh, we usually perform the preliminary uh, uh, spinal puncture uh, with injection of contrasegin or mipacotomoxazole. Uh, do contrast my uh, We use 10 milliliters of uh, contrast and the position patients with the uh, head uh, down and uh, for two, uh, 20 30 minutes. After that, uh, we uh, go uh, this patient to the OR. Uh, OR is a CT, uh, usual CT. And uh, we do local amputation of uh, skin and soft tissue with uh, nuclear pain. And uh, our target is space between C1, C2 uh, from another side. Uh, for example, if patient has the left side uh, uh, pain, we do left side for the pain. So the aim uh, is space between C1, C2, where uh, C2 knows to exist the channel. Uh, and uh, we um, the insertion is one uh, centimeter uh, inferior and posterior to mastoid uh, process. And uh, on CT and reconstruction, we can see the uh, between the two uh, octopus. Uh, so on uh, uh, space, we can see the uh, uh, We use uh, the uh, 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 several scans uh, uh, to uh, place uh, electro electroventral uh, half of spinal cord. Uh, and the uh, uh, patient usually is awake uh, for functional making, sensory and motor. Uh, So intratechal contrast excision is critical because if you don't have the myelography, you can uh, see the uh, you cannot see the spinal cord. If you uh, have the myelography, you can see the spinal cord very well. So we use the Kotman uh, RF generator. Uh, we use RF electrodes, uh, uh, special RF electrodes uh, for this procedure. Uh, and the uh, needle uh, we use to do the uh, so when we put electrode to the uh, spinal cord, we usually uh, see the impedance. Uh, and according to uh, numbers on the, on the display, we can see we can understand where we are. Uh, 200, uh, 300 ohms, uh, the CSF, uh, 506 here, and the more than uh, 700 is final code. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, of course, one it's a way patients are weak because we do ele uh, electrical stimulation. So, if we put the uh, 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 electrode right way to ventral half of central uh, spinal cord, contralateral, uh, when we, uh, we we perform the uh, 50 hertz uh, stimulation, and uh, what we see, we can see the pain, paresthesias, or warmth in the uh, lateral uh, uh, side of the body. And uh, uh, and the, it means that uh, uh, the needle um, is too ventral. And uh, uh, when we um, um, perform the motor uh, stimulation, we don't have any motor responses. Uh, uh, 
Imitation of the fibers provide the opportunity to select it for the pain. So, if the patient has the uh, uh, pain in the uh, hands or uh, upper body, it can do it more ventral, or if the in the legs, uh, more uh, dorsal. So, uh, there are tips to enhance success. So, uh, anatomic imaging and the physiological finding must agree. Uh, we should uh, do good visualization and uh, uh, fixate set in neutral position. So sometimes we can uh, put uh, the posterior. So uh, and we, uh, during this uh, stimulation, we uh, uh, can achieve the ipsilateral paresthesia. Uh, uh, so this is the and the ipsilateral motor contraction. So this is the science uh, that uh, we are not in the spinal uh, column. And uh, uh, good position, final position is a uh, uh, contralateral warm sensation and uh, uh, no ipsilateral motor uh, contra uh, contraction. Sometimes we can see the uh, when we do motor uh, stimulation, we can see only the uh, contraction of the uh, spinal muscles uh, very, very uh, low. After that, we perform the uh, test lesioning. Test lesioning with uh, 50 uh, Celsius, degrees Celsius for 20 seconds. And uh, uh, another check uh, for patient uh, if any uh, complications, if not, we perform the permanent lesion. It's 80 uh, degrees for three, 30 seconds. And uh, uh, after, after the first uh, lesion, uh, I usually uh, check the uh, sensation by uh, using the needle. If it's not enough, and uh, uh, also I use, uh, I ask patients uh, if uh, he uh, feels the pain in the uh, in the local area. Uh, if yes, I usually do two three lesion again, and they check again. So uh, after the lesion, uh, when I check the you know, sensation, uh, I could. Uh, even uh, put in the middle of the uh, arm and the uh, pa patient doesn't feel any pain. So after uh, uh, this is the memorize, uh, we can see the uh, site of the phototomy. We uh, started uh, our surgery. Uh, the first patients were in uh, 2019, but uh, the, uh, uh, the third patient was uh, continued in 2021. Uh, this time we performed uh, more than 50 patients. Uh, average age of patients is 55 with various forms of oncology. Uh, uh, eight of them with metastasis to various organs and bone structures and severe unilateral pain syndrome. Uh, one patient uh, was uh, with, with uh, post herpetic neurology. Uh, I want uh, to show this case uh, later, uh, explain this case. And uh, 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 sometimes we uh, treated uh, the patient with the uh, uh, excel pain, uh, but uh, anyway, I usually ask the patients uh, uh, where they feel the pain more from the right or left side, and uh, so decision making uh, according to their answers. So, um, um, in two patients, uh, we had the um, uh, complications as ataxia. Uh, patients after surgery was unable to walk, uh, but in uh, some time they uh, uh, okay. 
Well, the patients after the one month or seventy percent or more regression was in pain patients, uh, fifty or more uh, sweet. 30 to uh, 50 and uh, all of them uh, with the, uh, some kind of uh, 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 success. So the case with uh, post-capitic uh, neurology, that was the first time when we uh, uh, started to do uh, cordotomy for neuropathic pain because this patient uh, 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 with severe pain in the right chest, uh, 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 despite the taking tramadol or other uh, drugs, as uh, amitriptyline or vodka. Uh, actually, we recommended to perform breast surgery, uh, but uh, uh, operation, uh, uh, the surgery, uh, uh, was uh, denied because the patient had the chronic renal failure and uh, he uh, had the constant uh, dialysis courses. And uh, of course, the uh, anesthesia was not a choice for them, for him. So, the you know, neutral symptoms, it was decided for cognitive. And we know that after uh, our procedure, uh, the result was 70% uh, reduction of pain. So it was the, it's like a, a, a surgery of the of how to treat this patient other way, other, uh, other way. And uh, so it was successful. So we have the treatment for, uh, for the, we have the treatment for diffuse pain syndrome. Yeah, this is a, a single atomia. We uh, don't perform this surgery now, uh, but we are going to start this surgery uh, to disrupt the single bundle and the single cortex. cortex. Uh, uh, so we uh, just interrupt the affected pain circuit from the internality here. And the patient, uh, uh, patient's perception of pain uh, changes. Uh, so indication is patient with generalized pain uh, due to malignancy, and uh, this is the stereotactic uh, surgery, uh, refablation. Uh, and now we can perform the surgery with our uh, patient. This is the uh, as a ser as a uh, hospital series. Uh, so it's just to show you where the single. Uh, we will uh, we perform this single thing. Uh, so uh, the, uh, now we are achieving the progress uh, uh, to work together with the uh, palliative care uh, department and the uh, pain specialists, uh, because uh, most of them, all the patients uh, are under control of palliative, palliative care. Uh, specialists and uh, uh, can, uh, as neurosurgeons, we can uh, uh, help these patients and help to our colleagues, uh, our colleagues uh, to help our, their patients. And uh, uh, what the tips to enhance success, minimize complications? So uh, anatomical imaging and physiologic findings must uh, must be. So uh, the, uh, so we use the CT. Uh, for to perform this um, procedure uh, and the uh, myelography, contrast myelography. So good visualization is critical. Uh, head should be fixate, uh, fixated to neutral position uh, because if we, uh, the patient start to uh, move the head, uh, the very, very uh, thing uh, Electrode uh, could reposit, uh, change this, uh, its position. Um, actually, we don't have uh, experience for bilateral cervical cortotomy, but uh, uh, in a uh, couple of cases, we uh, uh, decided to perform another one, but 
approached our patients in six, seven months. Uh, they couldn't come to us because they died. So, uh, in conclusion, I want to say that neurosurgical ablative procedures can achieve significant pain palliation in the otherwise intractable pain intensive patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it was very interesting, um, but I, I have, a, of course, a few questions. The first, the first of my question is: You said that fifty percent of the patient with uh, a cancer uh, uh, problem, fifty percent are not enough, have a, a pain not enough controlled, uh, and you perform and you will evaluate the, the, that procedure for these patients. Uh, I, I'm convinced that uh, that uh, procedure works, but I do not understand why in Belgium we are not performing that. Perhaps you have an idea about that. It's my first question. My second question is, uh, you spoke about ataxia after performing a chordotomy of the spinothalamic tract. Uh, my first, my first, uh, fear would, would have been for the motor, uh, motor track because the motor track is just behind the, the spinothalamic track. Why do you observe 15% of ataxia? Uh, my third question is at the end of six months, because most of these patients do not have a long time of survival, at the end of six months, uh, what kind of, of uh, decrease uh, regarding the efficiency of your procedure on the pain. What kind of reduction do you observe after six months? And my last remark, uh, regarding the control of chronic pain by destruction of the central system, we have the dress, we have the cortotomy, we have the cingulotomy, but we have also the thalamotomy, the lateral thalamotomy. And do you have any experience regarding the, the lateral thalamotomy? Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, so, uh, uh, actually, about the question about uh, why you don't do, uh, but we do uh, cordotomy in our country. Um, actually, we have a very, uh, not very, but limited uh, kind of drugs for uh, good uh, uh, control of pain of oncological patients. Uh, maybe because uh, well, uh, palliative care specialists don't know enough drugs, maybe or we have the, some regulations about the, the drugs could be uh, used uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, so it was our suggestion that uh, we could uh, uh, treat them uh, uh, without drugs and uh, do this uh, procedure. But uh, uh, of course, um, uh, it's not a big number of the procedures we perform uh, according to the number of patients, oncological patients in Kazakhstan. We have more than, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, uh, 30,000 of oncological patients now in Kazakhstan uh, nowadays. And uh, uh, it's a big number, but uh, anyway, the uh, mostly, mostly 99% they uh, take drugs for pain. Uh, the second question is about ataxia. So, uh, from my point of view, that ataxia usually uh, <coughs> started not uh, for the reduction of the motor fibers. Uh, usually, after the phototomy. Uh, we uh, achieved the uh, uh, anesthesia, anesthesia uh, of the uh, limbs. And uh, if we perform the uh, cordotomia uh, more uh, dorsal, we can achieve the uh, uh, anesthesia of the uh, lower limb of the leg. And maybe, maybe they usually. Uh, they have been, uh, enough strengths for the leg, but uh, uh, because we check neurologically after the surgery, but they usually uh, suffer that uh, when they uh, stand, 
they don't feel the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the leg on the, on the foot. Oh, so maybe it's a, this is a cause of ataxia, uh, uh, my point of view. view. Uh, but uh, after uh, procedure, we uh, never uh, see the uh, motor complications as uh, paresis or some scurvies. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, after seven months, the situation after seven months or after procedure, uh, uh, not only after seven months, some patients uh, after three, four months, they, uh, they have the very slow decline of the uh, 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 anti painful effect. Uh, not uh, really uh, severe, but uh, the pain, they felt the pain more and more in, in the weeks. Uh, and then, uh, you know, this, uh, to follow up these patients uh, uh, actually is not so uh, easy because uh, should uh, change them, I don't know, maybe one, once a week or once a month, it's too uh, um, uh, less. Uh, so, um, in our experience, uh, actually, the uh, uh, don't have enough information about this uh, our uh, situation. But after uh, uh, procedure and uh, uh, at least one month, they felt uh, well without. Uh, uh, and about uh, the question about talamatomy. Actually, I do talamatomy uh, stereotactic uh, RF ablation for talamus for Parkinson disease. Uh, uh, what I don't do, I don't. I didn't perform uh, for pain, uh, but I had one experience to perform uh, deep brain stimulation for thalamus for pain, but it was not uh, uh, a successful uh, case. Uh, and um, so why maybe I uh, focus to the brain procedures as thalamotomy for pain patients. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Professor Turel is still here with us. Professor Turel, would you like to say something? Wonderful, Shaskin, good work. And this is a great uh, hope for patients in terminal pain. And I think this procedure should be encouraged so that they can have a dignified end. And uh, must congratulate you, especially because you have brought complications on the floor, which normally people <laughs> you know, I'm so concerned about people not talking about complications. So I'm glad that you brought them out on the floor. And uh, the question is, uh, over the period of time that you, how many years have you been doing this work of cordotomy? Since 2019. So long, long time. Uh, and how many patients do you think you've totally treated in 2009 till now? I performed uh, cordotomy. Cordotomy, 15. Not too much. Yeah, this is a very small number. Is it because you have not been able to market it? You know, but in a sense, talking yeah, to the yeah, yeah. cancer Maybe, departments, yeah. oncology department, because it's a, such a common problem. It needs to be, it, it should be one of the main treatments in oncological departments. Yeah, so I was curious to know. I was curious to know how uh, how frequently do you do it, and and then is there something like a learning curve? Because this is something that we would like to also uh, make use of. I have personally no experience of cordotomy, but uh, I have been hearing about it for many years. So uh, I just wanted to know how uh, how to uh, minimize the complications, and why did you always choose? C1, C2, is that the best way to enter the cord? The best location to enter the cord? Yeah, yeah, yeah. According to technique, this is the best location because the uh, window between the C1, C2 is uh, quite enough to uh, perform this procedure. So you do make sure that there is no CV junction problem because uh, if, you, uh, if you have a vertebral artery anomaly, you might land into difficulty. So would you be, of course, vertebral anomalies are above C1 usually. They're not between mm -hmm. C1 and C2. Have yeah, you, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, actually, uh, yes, uh, it, uh, it's one of the possible pro uh, publications to injure uh, the vertebral artery. Uh, but uh, uh, fortunately, we didn't have any uh, such complication. And uh, uh, how to check it? Uh, uh, yes, we could uh, uh, do. Uh, Arteriography, uh, contrast uh, uh, SL myelography, and we check the uh, vertebral activity. So, CT and you, or how do you? What is, how do you do it? Do you always do the. No, 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 I didn't do, I didn't do, but we could do to avoid these complications. It's it's a one of the options, but we didn't, we never, so it, we yes. never done yes. it. Yeah. Because it is so close to where you are entering from. Yeah, 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 you're right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no further questions, we can wind up this session and hear the concluding remarks from Professor Raftopoulos. It's very kind to, to, to give me again the floor. I would like to thank you, uh, Ryan, because it was a wonderful uh, uh, web seminar. I must say that I, I was very pleased to see again Kiki Turrell. It's a long time that I haven't seen and heard him it's very, very nice to, to see that it's a perfect condition. And uh, I would like to thank the two speakers, uh, my colleague Shaskin and our Italian colleague uh, for their very interesting lectures. And I'm waiting for the next uh, uh, ACNA, AC and S web, webinar. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Very well, thank you very much. We too are eagerly waiting to invite you for our next session. So I'll do the honors and close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Massimiliano Visochi and Professor Chingdi Shashkin and the Chair, Professor Christian Raftopoulos for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. Extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel and a special thanks to my co-host Dr. Liu Bun Seng for joining me today. Uh, special thanks to all the dignitaries who joined us panelists for today. So until we all meet online on uh, 1st of October, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.